for coming. And thank you for Skip for uh, recording this. And this will be uh, available on the internet uh, quite soon. So uh, thank you again for that. Uh, I'm representing the Cultural Affairs Committee. This is our second program this year. Uh, we have uh, some distinguished faculty guests with us tonight. We're happy to have them join us as well as the students who are here. I'd first of all like to introduce the wife of our guest, Sally Ann Rogers, uh, a student from uh, Florida, from West Palm Beach, who ended up in Lakeland, Florida. And that's where uh, Steve and I ended up as well at Florida Southern College. And uh, we were in the same fraternity there. And we had two years together. And in the third year, he left me high and dry and went off to Germany to study. So I was piqued at that, and I decided that I would leave him high and dry in our senior year, and I went off to study in Ireland. But lo and behold, after all of these years, I saw the name Stephen Rogers was giving a historical talk up at New Gloucester Historical Society. And I asked myself, could that be the same Stephen Rogers that I knew all these years ago back in Lakeland, Florida? And it turned out to be exactly the same one. So they summer on Sabbath Day Lake, and there's another indication that they are living the right way. So uh, Steve Rogers tonight is going to be speaking on the subject of prosecuting Nazi persecutors. And uh, he worked for many years in the uh, immigration and naturalization and then on the uh, criminal division at the uh, Justice Department, again, searching for people who had come into the country under false pretenses. So. We're very happy to have him here, and please give a welcome to Dr. Stephen Rogers. I want to keep time here so that we'll have time for the, the test at the end. There's a test, right, Mike? Okay. Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm just going to try to keep this as uh, informal as possible and leave some time for uh, questions at the end if you have them. Um, but I want to talk to, that's the very highfalutin uh, title, uh, but what I'd like to talk about tonight is essentially how the United States became involved in the search for Nazi war criminals. Now, we were certainly involved in this uh, type of activity immediately after World War II, but here it was in the, in the mid-1970s, so 30 years after the end of World War II, and all of a sudden the United States became reinterested in the search for Nazi war criminals uh, who escaped justice at the end of World War II. Now, when I use the term Nazi war criminal, uh, if I use that term, everybody seems to know what that means. You know, everybody knows who the Nazis were, and everybody, I'm sure, is quite familiar with, uh, to some degree anyway, the things that they did uh, during their regime in Germany between 1933 and 1945 when in fact most of the people that the United States became interested in in the 1970s were neither Nazis, most of them were Eastern Europeans who collaborated with the Nazis, and most of them weren't necessarily war criminals because a war crime is a violation of the rules of war. We have laws that dictate how civilized nations conduct warfare. So, the rules say that you can't, uh, you can't bomb or attack or destroy civilian populations or civilian centers. You have to take proper care of medical treatment, proper feeding, uh, proper housing of prisoners of war. There are rules how countries conduct war. So a war criminal is someone who has violated those rules. Most of the individuals that the United States was involved in looking for in the mid-1970s up until the present time didn't really, weren't really involved in these types of activities. But yet, we use the term Nazi war criminal because it's close enough to what 
It gets the idea across as to who these people were and what they did. And I'll clarify a little bit more uh, as I go along. So why, how did the United States get involved in the search for Nazi war criminals? Now, uh, at the end of World War II in 1945, uh, Nazism had been defeated on the battlefields of Europe. Um, some of the Nazi hierarchy uh, uh, were killed or died at the end of the war. Uh, some committed suicide, some were killed in bombings. Uh, but the United States and the various allied countries were able to capture a number of fairly high-ranking members of the upper echelons of the Nazi regime. And these people were tried at the Inter International Military Tribunal that was held at Nuremberg, Germany. Now, the International Military Tribunal was something that really, there really had never been uh, this type of uh, international effort to bring uh, the leadership of a defeated nation uh, to justice at the end of the war. This didn't really happen at the end of World War I. Uh, the war ended, and that was it. But because of the nature of the Nazi regime and what they did, and it wasn't just a war, but it was also a genocide. The Nazis were out to, to destroy people simply for who they were. And that was different. That was different. So the United States and the various victorious allies were able to capture a number of the higher ranking members of the Nazi leadership. And they were brought to justice where they were tried at Nuremberg. Uh, beginning in 1945 and going into 1946. And they were tried based on uh, rules that were set up by these allied uh, uh, entities uh, even before the war was over. Uh, the, the various leaders uh, met and discussed what are we going to do with the Nazi leadership once the war is over. And they determined that they were going to have this international military tribunal and uh, they would uh, charge the individuals with various types of crimes. War crimes, what I just described, crimes against humanity, aggressive warfare, uh, attacking countries without declaring war f first, that type of thing. And so in 1945, 1946, this Nazi leadership was tried at Nuremberg, uh, an international military tribunal. There were judges from the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. And at the end, uh, justice was ruled out, uh, uh, meted out. Uh, individuals were charged in various counts. And as a result, uh, several of these individuals were convicted and sentenced to death and were executed. Others were sent to uh, Spandau prison in Berlin uh, for lengthy uh, prison terms. Uh, and some uh, had lesser terms. And uh, there was actually a couple of individuals that were acquitted. But at the end of the International Military Tribunal, we had essentially decided that we had, in fact, brought the, 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 the surviving Nazi leadership to justice. The various Allied forces also had their own military tribunals at the end of the war uh, to, uh, to investigate and prosecute secondary and tertiary uh, members of leadership uh, cadres, as well as individuals who served as uh, concentration camp guards, uh, Gestapo agents, uh, people who were involved in propaganda, any number of things. And so these individual countries had their own military tribunals. The United States carried their trials out at the former concentration camp at Dachau. Most of the defendants in these cases were uh, former concentration camp guards. Same thing happened at the end of those tribunals. There were convictions, there were executions of some of the individuals. Others were sent uh, for lengthy terms in prison. And, uh, but by, pretty much by 1947, 1948, uh, we had considered the specter of, of Nazism dead. Like I said, the military had been de uh, defeated on the battlefield, and we had now brought the leadership to justice with people who were carrying out some of these uh, vicious, heinous crimes had been brought to justice. Nazism was for all intents and purposes dead. There was a new specter on the horizon, communism. There were people uh, in the Western Allies who felt that the war really didn't end with the defeat of Germany, that we should have just kept on going, 
that we were going to have to fight the Russians eventually. We had our military already in Europe. Why don't we take care of it? Well, it didn't work that way. They were our, our ally, the Soviet Union was, in fact, our ally, and, and that's the way they remained, at least through the, the uh, end of the war and, and bringing these individuals to justice. So that's how we dealt with the Nazis' leadership and other individuals at the end of World War II. And I just said that the, the specter of Nazism was dead. Well, we found out that that really wasn't true. There were a lot of people who slipped through the cracks. You probably all heard of, of allegations that, that uh, Nazis escaped to South America, and in fact, some of them did, uh, or went into, into the woodwork in Europe, or disappeared behind the Iron Curtain. We don't know what happened to some of them. Uh, but not everybody who was involved in these types of activities was, in fact, brought to justice. So it really wasn't until many years later that uh, allegations started popping up that there were some of these individuals still around, and what are we going to do with them? Uh, most, of the, most of the time, we, uh, this was a problem for the simple fact is we didn't know how to deal with them because to try to prove what they did, this wasn't the main leadership cadre that we had documentation on. These were the people way down at the bottom that were carrying out the orders. Uh, how are we going to bring these people to justice? If we could even find, find them, figure out who they were. So uh, it wasn't really until the 1970s that uh, attention began to, that we started paying uh, serious attention to some of these allegations that were floating around that some of these individuals were still around. So um, that's where I came in, into, uh, into the picture. It was uh, after, the, after the end of the war, uh, numerous allegations had been made that some individuals who had collaborated with the Nazis, again, as I mentioned earlier, that the individuals that the United States was looking at later on were not, in fact, Nazis, or not even Germans, but Eastern Europeans who collaborated with the Nazis. Uh, there was allegations that some of these people may have come into the United States after the war. And if that was, in fact, true, what were we going to do about it? We really didn't have any way of dealing with it. We'd never really dealt with this before. And if they were, in fact, in the United States, how did they get here in the first place? So we had to sort all of this out first. So what really brought attention to this, uh, this situation in the United States was uh, in the early, late 1960s, early 1970s, an allegation had come around that uh, had, had surfaced that a, uh, an infamous woman guard from uh, the Ravensbrück concentration camp and also served at the Majdanek concentration camp by the name of Hermine, Hermine uh, Braunsteiner, uh, was in fact living in the United States uh, in Queens in New York City. Uh, this allegation was brought to us uh, by Simon Wiesenthal, the, the well-known uh, Nazi hunter that was based in Vienna. And when it came to our attention that, that, that she might, in fact, be in the United States, uh, this matter fell into the hands of the Immigration and Naturalization Service because that was the agency in the, in the United States government at the time that dealt with all matters concerning who was able to come into the United States, who was allowed to stay here, who was allowed to become a U.S. citizen. So the matter was booked over to the INS, and they were asked to essentially, essentially determine whether Hemini Braunsteiner was in fact living in the United States, uh, where was she living, if we could find her, and is, was there any evidence that we could connect her with the allegation that she was a concentration camp guard in, at Ravensbrück and Majdanek. But the big question was, how did she get here in the first place? If we knew Hermione Braunsteiner was a concentration camp guard, how did she get into the United States? Well, when we finally were able to locate her in the United States, she was no longer Hermione Braunsteiner, she was Hermione Braunsteiner Ryan because she married an American GI at the end of World War II, and he brought her to the United States as his wife. And she was living in Queens with him. But the problem was the Immigration and Naturalization Service really didn't know how to go about investigating this type of an allegation. 
They were concerned with people who were coming across the border illegally from the United States, uh, from, uh, from Canada or from Mexico or places like that. But uh, an individual who came in from Europe and uh, who is alleged to be a Nazi, how are we going to investigate this? We, our, our, our agents don't speak German. Uh, where are we going to find the documentation? That type of thing. So all of a sudden we were, we were faced with a dilemma. How are we going to deal with this? And if Hermanny Braunsteiner had come to the United States, how many other Nazi perpetrators may have come into the United States after World War II? So with the, the knowledge of Hermanny Braunsteiner being here, uh, the United States uh, INS, and even, there was even uh, some congressional uh, inquiries into this, and we found that numerous allegations of various individuals who supposedly had collaborated with the Nazis had in fact come to the United States and were living here. And so INS started uh, initiating investigations into these individuals and ran into a major roadblock for the simple fact is that we had an individual, we had an allegation, but we had no evidence other than an allegation that someone had done this. We would have needed some kind of concrete evidence, eyewitness testimony or documentary evidence in order to prove that these individuals were here. Also, if they got here, wasn't there a way that we could have sorted out who these people were to, uh, before they even entered, entered into the United States? How did they get here in the first place? Well, I have to understand that at the end of World War II, the, um, the situation in Europe was, was chaos. Uh, most of Europe was laying in ruins. Uh, the infrastructure had been destroyed. And uh, it was going to be a massive effort to rebuild it. The other problem was, is in 1944 and early 1945, toward the end of the war, the Soviet Red Army was moving westward into, uh, into Europe, occupying uh, countries in Eastern Europe and pushing the German army in front of them as they retreated back to Germany. And along with the retreating Germans, we had a lot of individuals, civilians, who uh, were living in those European countries or in the former Soviet Union, who were also fleeing westward because they simply didn't want to continue living under Soviet domination. So not only was Europe in chaos, was the infrastructure destroyed, but you had this major, major influx of displaced persons and refugees into Western Europe, kind of what we're seeing today. Not quite the same circumstances, but the people who are flooding into Europe today when you're watching the news are fleeing to Europe, into that area of Europe, for the simple fact is they're trying to get away from where they live, where they come from. And that's what these people were doing. Not only the German army retreating, but these, this massive uh, influx of refugees and displaced persons. They ended up mostly in uh, Allied-occupied Germany. They were placed in various displaced persons and refugee camps until we could sort out what to do with them. The problem was we couldn't leave them there. There was just no, there was nothing for them to do there. There was no work. Uh, it was hard to keep them fed, it was hard to keep, uh, give them medical attention. Uh, that area just could not hold this massive influx of, of, of refugees and displaced persons. So we had to decide what are we going to do with them. And essentially this is what we're doing, uh, going to have to do now in Europe is what are we going to do with all these people who've, who've, who've moved into, uh, into Western Europe from the Middle East? Well. Various countries dealt with it in different ways. The United States decided that if we could find individuals who had uh, skills that could be used in the United States, or they had family here already, or they had sponsors who would take care of them and make sure that they were uh, properly housed and that they found jobs, uh, uh, we would try to figure out some way to facilitate their uh, entry into the United States. And one way that we did this is the United States Congress passed in 1948 a piece of legislation called the Displaced Persons Act. And the Displaced Persons Act provided for up to 400,000 immigrant visas for eligible individuals. Now, what was an eligible individual? 
again, someone who uh, had a skill or had family here or a proper sponsor. Uh, one of the things that we did not want to, to let into the United States were people who had collaborated with the Nazis or had committed war crimes or just people who had uh, criminal records, any number of things. So in order to determine who could get these uh, 400,000 immigrant visas, the Army Counterintelligence Corps sent their agents into these camps uh, to interview them to determine if they were in fact eligible. And one of the things that they would ask is, what did you do between 1933 and 1945? And their answer would be, I was a clerk. I worked in my father's farm. I did this, I did that. If they wanted to get a visa, they were going to come up with something uh, very innocuous. Most of the people who were interviewed told the truth of what they did. But some of these people didn't. Some of these people uh, had something to hide. As I mentioned, with this influx of refugees and displaced persons coming into Europe, most of the people were just what they purported to be, refugees, displaced persons. But some of the people who were fleeing west with the Germans were people who had collaborated with the Germans when the Germans were occupying those countries in Eastern Europe, serving as uh, auxiliary policemen, as concentration camp guards, as propagandists, as members of civ indigenous civilian administrations that helped the Germans occupy these areas. They needed additional manpower uh, in order to make their occupation work. When the Soviets started pushing in, they had no future there, and so they left. So when they, they ended up in the same displaced persons camps and refugee camps as all the rest of the people. And they said, well, we don't want to stay here. We don't want to go back to the Soviet Union. The United States was certainly not going to repatriate them to the Soviet Union against their will or to one of the Eastern European countries under Soviet domination. So when they were asked, what did you do between 1933 and 1945, they said, I was a clerk. I worked in my father's farm. I did this or I did that. If they wanted that visa, they certainly weren't going to say, I was an auxiliary policeman. I was a concentration camp. I like to beat up Jews. If they had said things like that, they would have never got their visa and they would have never been able to come into the United States. So what did they do? They lied. And there was no way really to disprove that lie because the only people who knew what they actually did were other people who did the exact same thing or the victims. And unfortunately, the victims were no longer around to point the finger at them and say, this is who these people really are. So these people got their immigrant visas. They came to the United States. Eventually, some, many of them became US citizens. And from that time on, Every once in a while, an allegation would, uh, would surface that an individual who had collaborated or assisted the Nazis was living in the United States. Someone was walking down the street in Cleveland or Chicago or Detroit and spotted someone that they remembered from a camp or from a ghetto. And these allegations would eventually be bucked up to the Immigration and Naturalization Service. They would do what investigating they could, but in fact, there was very little investigation at all because they didn't know where to go to look for the documentation. They didn't know where to, who to speak to. How were they going to be able to prove these allegations? So these allegations just surfaced. After they surfaced, they just gathered dust for years and years and years. And it wasn't really until the case of him, meaning Braunstein or Ryan living in New York, pointed to the fact that, that a Nazi perpetrator was, in fact, living in the United States. So when that came to light, then all of a sudden these allegations that have been floating around and gathering dust at INS also surfaced. And as a result of this, the House uh, Subcommittee on Immigration held hearings and were shocked to find that there was this many allegations floating around that INS really had never given proper attention to. And as a result of this, in 1977, they set up in the INS a special a task force called the Special Litigation Unit, which is essentially tasked with looking into these allegations, determining if there was anything to it. As I mentioned earlier, most of the INS people didn't have the, uh, the specialty, didn't have the, the, uh, the necessary language skills or access to documents. So we felt that with a special task force, that was, this is all that they had to do, 
that hopefully we might be able to make some sense out of this. When the Special Litigation Unit was established in 77, it was staffed mostly with immigration attorneys, and they were going down to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., where all the, the captured documents, German documents that we had gathered at the end of the war that we used at the uh, Nuremberg trials, was where they were kept. And all of a sudden they realized we have a problem. What was that problem? All the documents were in German. And they couldn't read them. So they decided, well, we need to find somebody who knows German, who understands German, who understands how the Nazi regime worked, how the concentration camps worked, how the police worked, how the Gestapo worked, get them to go into the National Archives and start digging and coming up with the evidence that they would need uh, to make sense out of these allegations. Uh, so that started in 1977. Um, and and uh, I was brought on board in uh, the summer of 1978. And I was told at that time that this was just a temporary thing. These allegations had been floating around for so long. What we wanted to do is, is determine if there was anything to any of them, bring the most promising course cases to court, and uh, that would be the end of it. But how were we going to prosecute these individuals? What were we going to charge them with? What was our jurisdiction? Whereas the International Military Tribunal and the other subsequent uh, allied tribunals at the end of the war tried these people criminally, it was determined that we really didn't have the law on our side to do that. For the simple fact is that the crimes that were committed were not committed against U.S. citizens, were not committed on U.S. territory or territory that was occupied or administered in some way by the United States. So we had no criminal jurisdiction in these cases. So what could we do to bring these people to justice? Well, what we could do is to prove that when they applied for their visas, or when they subsequently became US citizens, that they lied in order to get that visa or in order to get that citizenship. They lied or they misrepresented the material facts when they applied for their visa and when they applied for the citizenship. They procured the U.S. citizenship or their entry into the United States by fraudulent means. So what we could then do is if we could show that they came into this country illegally through fraud, or if they got their citizenship illegally through fraud, we could first, if they were U.S. citizens, strip them of that U.S. citizenship, revoke their naturalization, and then subsequently go into immigration court <coughs> and move to deport them from the United States. Well, this turned out to be a much bigger task than the, uh, they envisioned for the Special Litigation Unit at INS. So in 1979, the Attorney General Griffin Bell, during the Carter administration, established a new office within the criminal division of the United States Department of Justice called the Office of Special Investigations. And this agency was staffed with about 50 to 60 uh, individuals, uh, immigration attorneys, uh, historians, research analysts, uh, paralegals, that type of uh, personnel. And uh, we were essentially charged to take over the work of the Special Litigation Unit, that this was going to be a bigger effort than we originally envisioned. So the, special uh, the Office of Special Investigation was established in 1979, and we were essentially charged with taking these allegations going in and determining if there was anything to these allegations and that we could get them into, into a courtroom and see what we could do. Uh, we ran into a lot of different problems uh, during that time because we had, uh, each case was, uh, was different. Uh, and the, uh, the other uh, uh, problem that we ran into was the fact that since these individuals weren't Germans, we had lots and lots of documentation about what the Germans did. We had lots of unit histories about what various military units did, what various agencies did, how the whole hierarchy worked. But again, these, most of these individuals were not Germans. They were Eastern Europeans who collaborated with the Germans. These were the people who had fled westward, ended up in the displaced persons camps, pretty much with the clothes on their backs. They didn't come with uh, birth certificates, marriage certificates, uh, work history, or anything like that. So we essentially had to uh, rely on what they told us when they applied for their visas and their subsequent citizenship. 
So what we were able to do is then take the immigration records, which all survived, are all kept down in, in the limestone caves outside of Kansas City, Missouri. We could pull up and actually see the forms that these individuals filled out when they applied for the visas and when they applied for the U.S. citizenship. And we could see what they said, that they were a, a clerk or they worked on their father's farm. And then our historians could then go into the archives and say, the allegation saying that they were a policeman or they were in a concentration camp guard is we could build up a case as to what, how these camps worked, how these various police units worked. And then we could go into the archives and look for rosters and try to find uh, documentation that would have the individual's name on it in order that we could prove this case. It took a lot of time to do this. One of the problems we were running into, too, is the simple fact that now it was 1970s, moving into the 1980s, going in almost four decades after the end of the war, a lot of these people were getting old. And I hate to tell you, but the, the, uh, the judicial system in the United States works very, very slow. For the simple fact is, is that you have to get it right. It takes time to put a case together. And uh, uh, it, it's just something you can't rush through. And I'm going to give you a, a case. Uh, how are we doing on time here? A case uh, to, to give you an idea just how complicated uh, this case could be. As I said, the, uh, the Office of Special Investigations took over a number of these cases, and we took the most promising ones uh, to take them into, the, into court. And um, one of the, the original cases that we, uh, we uh, inherited was a case of a fellow by the name of Ivan or John Demyanyuk. He's probably one of the, our, the more famous cases that uh, my office worked with. He uh, was one of the original ones that we uh, inherited. The allegation against him was that he was the fellow known as Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. Treblinka was one of the extermi Nazi extermination camps in Poland. And he ran the gas chambers at Treblinka. He had come to the United States. He was a Ukrainian. He had come to the United States. He was a displaced person, one of these people, displaced persons that ended up in the camps in Germany. He applied to come to the United States. He said that he served in the Red Army that he was captured and that he was a prisoner of war and that he was liberated and made his way back to Western Europe and that's where he went into the displaced persons camp. No derogatory information could be found on, on him. He got his visa and he came to the United States and he eventually became a U.S. citizen, living outside of Cleveland, working at a Ford auto plant in Cleveland, raising his family, going to church and pretty much being a, what, my, uh, what our first director called a quiet neighbor. He didn't do any, he was a good citizen, good U.S. citizen. But the allegation had been, had been sitting around for a long time that he was, in fact, Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. So when the Office of Special Investigation was charged to look into this case, the first thing we had to do was was to determine what he put on his application. He didn't say anything about serving at Treblinka. Had he said he'd served at Treblinka, uh, he would have never gotten his visa in the first place. Uh, so there's nothing there. So what we had to do then is to go into the archives and start building a case against John Demyanik of Treblinka. We had to go in and show how the concentration camps worked, how Treblinka worked, who was sent there, what was the hierarchy, what was the command structure, all this had to be put together. And then we have to, have to start looking for documentation that would prove that he was, in fact, Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, that he was actually there. Well, like I said, most of these people ended up in the camps with the, the, the clothes on their back. He didn't have any identification, documentation, or anything to show what he'd actually done. Uh, he expected us to believe him, and we did and we couldn't find any derogatory information to prove him wrong. So here he was in the United States living as a quiet neighbor. Well, one of the, when we asked where did this original allegation come from, it came from uh, Soviet sources. They had a document, they had a identity card 
that showed that Ivan Demyanyuk had in fact been a, served in the Red Army, had been captured, was in a German POW camp, but at some point had been taken out of that POW camp and sent to a, a training camp that the SS operated called Travniki. And this was a training camp for individuals that the Germans hoped to use uh, for carrying out various uh, punitive actions in Eastern Europe, primarily in Poland. Most of these people were selected because they had a, 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 a distinct uh, sadistic bent. Uh, they were looking for people. A lot of these Travniki men uh, assisted the SS in the uh, uh, clearing out of the, the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, they were pretty nasty people. Well, the Soviets had an identity card showing that Ivan Demyanyuk was, in fact, uh, had trained at Travniki and had been sent to Treblinka and also to Flossenburg, another concentration camp. This was a key piece of evidence for us. The only problem was it came from the Soviet Union. And there was all kinds of allegations of that the, 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 these, it was an attempt by the Soviets to discredit a member of the Ukrainian community living in the United States. Well, eventually, we told the Soviets we couldn't use just a copy of that card. We needed to have the, the, the actual card. It had his photograph on it, had all his personal information on it, and in order to prove that it was authentic. And they eventually sent it to the United States, and we were able to do forensic testing on it and showing that the paper was, was proper, the ink was proper. It came from that time period. It wasn't a, a, an identity card, a piece of, of evidence that the Soviets somehow had cooked up in order to discredit this individual. It appeared to be legit. We filed a case against Ivan Demyanik that he had misrepresented material facts when he applied for a visa when he and when he subsequently became a U.S. citizen by not revealing the fact that he had served as a concentration camp, uh, member of the concentration camp personnel at Treblinka, also alleging that he actually ran the gas chambers. We went into U.S. District Court in Cleveland to move to uh, strip him of his U.S. citizenship for the simple fact that he had lied about who he was when he applied for his visa. This was a uh, case held in front of a judge. There was no jury involved because it was a civil action. It was not a criminal action. We were only moving to the strip of his citizenship. We weren't prosecuting him for the actual crime, although we had to prove that a crime was actually committed but then we had to go the next step to prove that he lied about his participation in that crime. And that's what we were punishing him for, the lie and not the crime. Some people say that was not enough, but that's what American law provided for. We went into a U.S. District Court. We proved, uh, charging him that he was Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka and Ivan the Less Terrible of Flossenburg. Those were our terms. And uh, the judge ruled in our favor, but only on the Treblinka charge. But that was enough to strip him of his U.S. citizenship. So our next step was to go into uh, immigration court to move for his deportation from the United States. We were also successful in that effort. And also, when, after we denaturalized him, we went through appeals all the way up to the Supreme Court. Immigration, you go up through the appeals process, a very, very lengthy process. And once he was ordered deported, then we had to define a country that would take him. And that wasn't always easy, because people didn't want these individuals, for obvious reasons. While the United States was attempting to deport him, we got an extradition request from the state of Israel that we send him to Israel to stand trial there for his crimes. Now, that was fine with us. Our, our job was to get him out of the United States. So if we could extradite him, uh, deportation is when the United States sends somebody out of the country. Extradition is when another country asks us to send them someone so that they can prosecute them for one reason or another. So we put our deportation hearings uh, on hold and he was formally extradited to the state of Israel where he was tried for being Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. He was convicted, he was sentenced to death by hanging, and was sitting on death row in an Israeli prison 
while his case was on appeal to the Israeli Supreme Court. Eventually, the Israeli Supreme Court decided that the prosecutors in Israel had not made a criminal case against Ivan Dinyan. And for the simple fact is there had always been some doubt that Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka was not Ivan Dimyanyuk, but Ivan Marchenko. And with that doubt, the Israeli Supreme Court vacated the conviction against Ivan Dimyanyuk. So what could they do? They could prosecute him on the other count of being a Flossenberg guard, or they could just decide that was going to be it. We're not going to do anything more. That's what they chose to do. And what did Israel do? They deported him. And where did they deport him? To the United States. Because that's where he came from. That's where he came from. We had to take him back. We had not formally deported him yet. So he was back in the United States. And with the doubt that was cast in Israel about him being Ivan the Terrible, the United States started rethinking its case against him. Did we actually prove that he was Ivan the Terrible? There was some doubt now. A special master was appointed by the Attorney General to look into this, and they in fact determined, he in fact determined that no, we did not make our case. So the U.S. citizenship that had been stripped from Ivan Demyanyuk was restored, and he was now a U.S. citizen again. So what could the United States do? Well, since we charged him on two counts, but the original judge only prosecuted him or convicted him on one count, we were able to go back into uh, district court and move for his denaturalization a second time on the Flossenberg count. And that is, in fact, what we did. It went through the appeals process, and then it went into immigration court, and we sought deportation a second time. And while we were looking for a country that would take Ivan Demyanyuk, the Federal Republic of Germany, to whom we have tried to deport him and who had always refused to take him, asked for his extradition to Germany to stand trial there. We said, let's do it this way. Instead of us extraditing him to you, like we did to the Israelis, why don't we deport him to Germany? And then you can do whatever you want to once he gets there. But the caution being is that if the Germans decided not to do anything eventually, or if they tried him and acquitted him, he couldn't come back to the United States. We made our case against him. Now it was up to the Germans to make theirs. Well, the Germans eventually did uh, prosecute Ivan Demyanyuk charged him with approximately, I can't remember the exact number, it was 135 or 137,000 counts of complicity in murder for his service as a concentration camp guard. And he was convicted in Germany. Germany didn't have capital punishment, and so he was sentenced to life in prison at the age of, I believe it was 92. And he died a short time after that in Germany as a convicted Nazi perpetrator. How long did that case take? The United States started investigating it actively in 1977. And it was 2000, I believe it was 2008, when we got him out of the United States, and uh, just a couple years ago when he died. So you do the math. You're college students, you can do the math. That's a long, long time. That's a long, long time. That's just one instance of the, the type of cases that the Office of Special Investigation was involved in. We, we inherited a couple of dozen cases when we started out in 1977, 1978. Uh, we eventually investigated close to 1,800 uh, individual allegations of individuals. As we, as we searched for documentation on the original group that we were investigating, we started locating rosters with other names on it. We started running those names through the immigration computers to see if they came to the United States. We started getting more and more people added to our list. So from just a couple of dozen people up to 1,800 
potential investigations that the office handled. What do we do with the names that we weren't able to find in the United States? Well, we posted those on the various border lookout systems. And uh, over the years, we posted almost 60,000 names onto the border lookout systems. And occasionally, on a Friday afternoon, we would get a call from uh, Logan or O'Hare or JFK saying, we've got a guy here who came in on a Lufthansa flight from Germany, and he matches uh, this posting that you gave us. What are we supposed to do with him? And so we would ship our documents and the information we had on an individual. We would interview him in secondary inspection after he got off the plane. And if we determined, in fact, that he was the same individual, he got back on the same plane he was on and went back to Germany. So not only were we working to remove individuals who collaborated with the Nazis from the United States, but we took a proactive stance to keep those who were out there who were still alive. When we put them on the list, we didn't know if they were alive or where they were. We just knew that they didn't belong here. Uh, so we have started taking proactive uh, uh, steps to, to interdict these individuals attempting to, to enter the United States even at the present day. So uh, how are we doing on time here? So that's how we dealt with Nazis. What about the modern cases? Well, that's all I'm going. The Nazis were not the only people, the Germans were not the only people who committed war crimes or crimes against humanity. It goes on to this very day. We saw it in Rwanda, we've seen it in Cambodia, we've seen it in West Africa, we've seen it in Bosnia. It keeps on going. We learned some lessons from what the Nazis did, but we didn't learn them well enough to stop doing it's, I don't know if it's human nature or what, but it's, it's something that has not stopped. So there still is an active effort to prosecute modern war criminals, as we like to call them now. Uh, we run into the same problems that we ran into investigating the, the Nazi cases. Where are you going to come up with the evidence? You know, the Rwandan genocide, where are you going to come up with documentary evidence? Because these were groups that just went out into the bush and hacked people to death and then went to the next village and hacked more people to death. Where, where were you going to get the documentation to prove that? They didn't keep documents. They just did it. What about eyewitnesses? Well, again, the only eyewitnesses to most of, what, most of these activities were the people who were doing the hacking and those who were being hacked. And the people who were being hacked weren't around to tell us anything anymore. So this is a problem when you deal with cases like this is that even though these are horrendous crimes, uh, you still have to prosecute them based on law. You can't just say, I heard you were a bad guy, so you can't live here anymore. You got to go someplace else. It doesn't work that way. They broke the law to get here. They broke the law to stay here. But you have to use the law to get them out. You know, it's, it's, they, but they don't have the right to be U.S. citizens. They don't have the right to live in the United States if they did these types of activities. So part of what we were doing is, is basic criminal prosecutions, civil prosecutions, but more importantly, by doing this research, bringing these people to justice, getting them out of the United States, we were setting the historical record straight. We were letting the world know that we knew who these people were, that we knew what they did, that we would not tolerate that type of individual living in our midst, and hopefully other civilized nations will take the same steps to make sure that this doesn't happen again in the future. Past is prologue. We learn by our past. A lot of people say, well, they're old guys now. Well, you know, they've been here for 30, 40 years. They're, they, they raised their family, they got grandchildren, had nothing to do with this. You know, let's leave them alone. Let's, that's past. Let's forget about it. You can't forget about it. You can't forget about it. If, you, if, you're, if you're silent to these types of things, they're bound to happen again. 
there's the old saying is that people didn't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. It's, it's somebody else. Well, when they came to take the Jews away, nobody said anything, and the Jews disappeared. They came to take the gypsies away, nobody said anything, and the gypsies disappeared. They came to take the homosexuals away, nobody said anything, and the homosexuals disappeared. What happens when they come to take you away? Who's going to say anything? There won't be anybody left. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And Thanks. Some questions, or Skip, if, if he repeats the question, is that good enough? We don't need to use this for the questioner. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're open to any questions that you have. Just address them to Steve. And Steve, if I could ask you to summarize the question sure. in, into the microphone. Okay. It's open. And could I encourage uh, the first few questions to come from students, uh, please? A anything at all? Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, the Dimnyanya case, the question was how long does it take to prosecute an average case? Um, the Dimnyanya case that I just cited, that was very unique, very unique. Once we received an allegation, uh, we would have to f determine whether the person was living in the United States, whether they were still alive, look at the uh, allegation, start going into the, uh, the, to the document uh, repositories, the National Archives, archives in other countries, trying to build a documentary case. We had routine checks we made with other agencies, FBI, CIA, United States Army, foreign checks with the Germans, uh, other uh, archives in other countries, to put the case together. Once we determined that we had a good prima facie case against an individual, then we would contact that individual, tell them that we think that they were less than candid about their activities during We'd like to discuss it with them. And then based on our interviews with the subjects, we would decide whether we had a good case against them. We would then go file the case in federal court or immigration court, and then it would be scheduled and we would be assembling the, the case. Uh, then we would try the case, and then we would wait around for a decision that could take anywhere. Uh, I think the quickest decision we got was in, the, in about a month. Uh, some cases we waited months and months and months and, and, and into years for a decision. Um, once we got a decision, uh, then it would go through appeals, uh, court of appeals, up to the Supreme Court possibly. Uh, and then if it was a denaturalization, we'd have, then have to go into immigration court, do the whole thing over again through appeals. Uh, and then try to, if they're ordered deported, try to find a country that would take them. So, uh, as you can see, all the cases were involved. Now, sometimes we had an instance where an individual, when they were faced with what we had against them, uh, volunteered to leave on their own. And that was the end of the case. But uh, that's a long way of saying it, it took a long time, uh, certainly years. Certainly years. Very, very slow. Very, very slow. Yes, sir. Okay. Question is, if individuals that were coming into the United States uh, based on the uh, lookouts that we posted and we interdicted them at a port of entry, uh, did we, uh, uh, if we, if we kicked them out of the United States and sent them home, did we notify those countries uh, that we had found them? Answer is yes. Now, it would be up to that country uh, to decide whether there was anything uh, that they were going to do. And in, in the case of Germans who came over, a lot of them were uh, former SS officers, and that was enough to put them on a list. Now, they might ultimately prove to us that they didn't do anything, but just the fact that they were SS officers was enough to put them on the prescribed list. 
Uh, if they came over uh, and we sent them back to Germany, we would, we would certainly notify the Germans that they attempted to enter the United States and we rejected them. Uh, then it was up to the Germans whether they were going to do anything. German law stated that they really could only prosecute these individuals uh, if they could prove base, what they call base mode of murder. That they killed somebody because they were Jews or gypsies or homosexuals. All we had to do was prove that they collaborated and lied about it to strip them of their citizenship and remove them from the United States. German law said they would only prosecute these individuals if they could actually prove that they killed somebody. Or, or even beat some people up, but I mean for base motive, for base motives. Uh, not because they shot somebody, you know, as an SS officer they shot somebody during the wartime. That's not, that wouldn't, that wouldn't fit. So it was, up to the, it was up to the country to determine whether they were going to do anything. But we certainly notified them and we also said if you want to see what we have on the individual we'd be more than happy uh, to share it with you. And that was in, in the Demyanyuk case when the Israelis asked for them, we collaborated and assisted the, the Israeli uh, prosecutors and investigators and then when he was sent back to Germany uh, more recently, we, their people came over to the United States. We sent our people to Germany to help them build their case against him for the German courts. So, yes, we would, and we, just like we expected these countries to help us when we asked for it, uh, we were more than happy to, to share what we had with them uh, in return. You had a question. Um, no, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The question was, now that it's 2015, has the prosecution of Nazi criminals decreased uh, significantly? And the answer is yes. For the simple fact is there was the, a, a biological solution to this problem. These people are getting old. They're dying off, dying off very, very fast. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the Danya case, uh, he was in his 90s when it was all sorted out. Um, in, um, uh, during the, uh, the early uh, first administration, uh, first uh, Obama administration, uh, when they were talking about is there ways that we could consolidate uh, U.S. government efforts, uh, cut out redundancies uh, in various uh, American government uh, agencies, uh, my office was one that uh, can't, fell in the, uh, the gun sites uh, of this because Although we were charged uh, and tasked with investigating Nazi war crimes, uh, there was another uh, office in the Department of Justice that was looking into uh, the modern war crimes cases. And it was looked at the time that said, well, these Nazi cases are winding down. Uh, is there a way that we might be able to merge uh, these two uh, offices together? And in fact, that's what happened in 2010. And, uh, and that's when I retired. Uh, I didn't retire because there was no more work to do. It was just the simple fact is um, there were modern cases, but my, my specific expertise was, was, were German cases. And I'd already been at this for 32 years, and I decided it was time to do something else. When I started this job, when I was hired to do this job in 1978 with the Special Litigation Unit, I was told that this job would probably only last two or three years that we're going to be blowing these dust off these original allegations, make sense out of the most promising ones, get them into court, and that would be the end of it. it turned out to be a much more involved process than any of us imagined. Uh, so when the Office of Special Investigations was established in 1979, uh, then I was told maybe four or five more years. And uh, that was fine. I mean, I trained to, I trained to go into academe. You know, I, I got my doctorate and I thought I was going to go out and be a college professor somewhere. Um, so I stayed on with it. It was, it was fascinating work. It was very righteous work. I enjoyed, I enjoyed, it's not the right word, but it was very challenging uh, work. And uh, it's not how I imagined my career going. But by 2010, most of the Nazi cases were, were winding down. And the simple fact is with these people being in their late 80s, going into their early 90s, and when I just explained how long these cases can take to put together, to get them into court, to go through the appeals process, and to get them out of the United States, we knew that these people were never going to survive that whole, that whole time period. 
That doesn't mean that we didn't do it, but eventually there was, the numbers just dwindled and dwindled. Right now, the new office, that's uh, the uh, consolidated office is now called the Office of Human Rights and Special Prosecutions. Uh, there are a couple of Nazi cases still floating there. I mean, they were actively working on them, uh, but most of the efforts on, on the modern cases. But the simple fact is the chances of that case ever being, uh, those investigations ever being brought to the ultimate conclusion, highly unlikely. But that doesn't mean we won't do the work. Because it is, like I said, we're setting the historical record straight as well. So that we know who these people are and what they did. Yes, sir. Yes, the, uh, the, 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 the law, uh, the, the directive that set up my office uh, was to investigate uh, activities of war crimes and crimes against humanity under the aegis of the Nazi government in Germany and or its allies. And in fact, over the years, we did have some instances of um, Japanese uh, allegations. The simple fact was we were really only interested in those individuals who were residing in the United States. And where there was a large number of individuals who were involved in Nazi-sponsored persecution living in the United States, uh, almost no proven cases of, of, this, of, of Japanese perpetrators being in the United States. There was some evidence that uh, some of the Japanese doctors that were involved in biological warfare experiments uh, that the United States tapped into some of that knowledge and data at the end of the war, but we could never prove that any of these individuals were actually in the United States. So what we were able to do is to put the names of those individuals onto the various border lookout systems, and we did have two or three instances of, of uh, Japanese perpetrators uh, attempting to enter the United States, and we were able to interdict them and send them back. So uh, the other problem was that the Germans, <coughs> excuse me, the Germans were very, very cooperative with us uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the history of, of my office and what we were trying to do, uh, giving us uh, free access to archives and their judicial records. Uh, they weren't real cooperative with us when we tried to deport people back to Germany, but as far as assisting us in investigations, uh, uh, there's no complaints there. Uh, the Japanese uh, were not cooperative at all. Uh, even really until this day, they have a hard time admitting um, what some of their people did uh, during the war. Uh, and they also have a very um, I don't know what the word I want to use for it. Their, their, their privacy laws are such that I mean, not only could we not go into their archives and do research on our own, uh, but the simple fact is, is that if we asked the Japanese government to provide us even a date of birth of an individual, we had a name, but we needed a date of birth so we could carry out our investigation, their privacy laws would not allow them to provide us with the date of birth unless that individual or a um, representative of his family would allow it. So it made it very, very difficult to, uh, so all we really could do was if we, could, if we could identify them and if we suspected that they might still be alive somewhere in the world, uh, we put them on the board lookout system and if they tried to enter the United States, we'd, we'd catch them and kick them up. Anybody? Yes. But computerized systems, they just go on, and uh, there's no, there's no uh, statute of limitations on it or anything like that, or after 25 years it, it comes off. They're just names that are put onto these computers. And so if you ever cross the border and they take your passport and they scan it like this, or they punch a number in it, uh, that's what they're doing is they're running it through the various. These are not just lookout systems for Nazis. I mean, these are terrorists, uh, bike marketeers, drug runners. Uh, drug cartel people, well, they all go on this list. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of names on these lists. So no, they don't, no, we don't take them off. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Well, when we started, uh, there was some concern that because of the nature of the cases that we would really never uh, get very far with this, uh, just because of the time passed and trying to prove the case. Um, but the question was, how many people did we actually, that we investigated, did we actually report? Um, we, uh, over the, the history of the office, we denaturalized uh, over 100 individuals. I can't give you the exact number anymore. Um, and uh, of those, uh, most of them uh, were deported. We had some instances where um, when we tried the individual uh, or were prosecuting the individual, they were in advanced age. Uh, we knew that they might probably would not live out the, the appeals process. And uh, they, uh, they said, well, if I give up my citizenship, uh, can I stay in the United States? And uh, we determined, well, part of our job was to denaturalize these people. So if they were willing to voluntarily give up their citizenship, which, you know, is, is in my, in my uh, mind, is a, is a pretty uh, strong punishment to lose your citizenship. Uh, but we did make uh, agreements in a couple of cases where we chose not to deport uh, for the simple fact that they would have never survived until it was over anyway. So we got, and we don't have to use taxpayers' money to go into court and de uh, denaturalize them. So like I said, each case was a little bit different. But we were very, very successful. We did lose some cases. As I said, we had to go up in front of a judge. We had to convince a judge that we had a case. And these were cases that took place in little tiny villages in little tiny countries that a lot of people had never heard of before. So when we go, go into a courtroom to prove this case, I mean, it's hard enough to prove a case uh, that a, a person did a certain thing at a certain time at a certain place. But when you have to go into a courtroom, the first thing you have to do is put a map up to show the judge this is where Lithuania is and then explain how the Germans moved into Lithuania and how the whole thing worked and how the, eventually how this subject, the guy that we're investigating, fit into this picture. And that's what we had to do in these cases. We had to go up and, and essentially convince a judge who had absolutely no idea how any of this worked before the case started. So uh, we count ourselves very lucky that we were as successful as we were. We did lose a couple of cases. We won a couple of cases and lost them on appeal. Uh, and that happens. That happens, and, but we moved on, we moved on. But we were very, very, very successful. Originally said we were only gonna last three or four years, and the fact that we went on for 32 years, uh, I think speaks to the fact that we were that successful. Because if we weren't successful, if we were filing cases and losing them left and right, I guarantee you we wouldn't have spent 32 years doing it. Yes, sir. Yes, we did. The question was, did we ever deport anybody to the Soviet Union or to their satellite, Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe uh, satellite states? Uh, yes, we did. When someone is ordered deported, they have some say into where they'll be deported. And if they can't find a country that will take them, and uh, then the United States can look for a country that will take them, and a formula comes into the process uh, the country that they were born in, the country that has jurisdiction, uh, presently has jurisdiction over the country they were born in, um, the last country they were in before they entered the United States. So we had one case, a fellow by the name of Carl Lennis. He was an Estonian. Um, he was a concentration camp guard, uh, came to the United States, became a U.S. citizen. Uh, we were able to prove, in fact, that he had been a concentration camp card at Tartu in Estonia. Estonia was the only country uh, occupied by the Germans that was officially designated as Judenfrei, free of Jews. They were Jews to start out with, but there was a number of Jews that were deported to Estonia by the Germans early on. But uh, he was certainly part of that process. 
We stripped him of his U.S. citizenship. We went into court, immigration court, to deport him. Um, and uh, our argument was is that Germany didn't want him. It was the last country he was in before he came to the United States. Germany didn't want him. Said, so why would we want him? Well, he worked for you. Well, that wasn't enough for the Germans. So the Germans didn't want him. Uh, we could send him back to the country that he was born in. Well, he was born in Estonia. Uh, or the country that had currently had a jurisdiction uh, over that country, which, which was then the Soviet Union. So our argument was is that we should de deport him to the Soviet Union. The reason we couldn't deport him to Estonia was because Estonia didn't exist anymore. It was at one time an independent country, but was now a constituent republic of the Soviet Union. The problem that we ran into then was the fact that the United States did not recognize the Soviet incorporation of Estonia. As far as we were concerned, it was still a independent country occupied by the Soviets, not part of, uh, formal part of the Soviet Union. So his argument also too was that he had been tried in absentia by the Soviets after the war and sentenced to death. And he said, if you send me back to Estonia, they're going to put me up against the wall and shoot me. And you can, you can apply for relief from deporta deportation if you can prove that you will be persecuted if you're sent back to a particular country, even though that was his job of persecuting people. He was afraid he would be persecuted if we sent him back to the Soviet Union. Our argument was that's the country he should go to. He chose to be deported to the Republic of Estonia. The Republic of Estonia didn't exist anymore, except as far as the United States was concerned. We still recognized the Republic of Estonia, but they had no territory to deport him to, other than a consular office in New York City. They said, well, that was not practical. Eventually, we finally decided that we was, and, and, and we went up to the Supreme Court and they said that the Soviet Union was a country that he could be deported to. And we figured that he would eventually end up in Soviet Estonia, but we would not send him directly to Soviet Estonia because we did not recognize the Soviet incorporation of Estonia. So we did put him on a plane in New York City and we flew him to Prague. And he got off the plane in Prague and onto an Aeroflot plane and flew him to Moscow. And the other thing that the Soviets said is, well, if you send him back here, we will vacate the trial in absentia and we will retry him. So he'll have a fair trial. And uh, so he went back and he was sent up to uh, Estonia to stand trial and he died. He died. No, he, I mean, he was not, he was not well. He was, an, he was an older gentleman and he was not well. Uh, no, nothing, nothing shady about it. But he died before they could try him. And uh, and his family had his body brought back to the United States and he's buried on Long Island. So we got him out of the United States. Once you're dead, then it's, it doesn't matter anymore. Yes, sir. Did you ever have anyone that when you tried to deport them, you couldn't find anywhere to put them? Like a country that they were not in? Uh, no, the question is, do we ever find uh, not find a country that would take them. Uh, no, we really never ran into that, into that problem. Um, we had a, a fellow who was uh, a, a Romanian uh, who was involved uh, in the uh, student uh, uh, fascist league in Romania, the Iron Guard, and um, uh, preached horrible things uh, about what should, what should happen to the Jews of Romania. And uh, he came to the United States and became Archbishop of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And when he was still an, uh, an, uh, the Archbishop Trifa, uh, when we prosecuted him, and he was stripped of his citizenship and ordered deported, and he was able to arrange uh, to go to Portugal. And uh, he went to Portugal. Portugal knew who he was and what we alleged that he did, uh, but they chose not to 
take any action against them, and he lived the rest of his life in Portugal. But uh, no, but sometimes it took it took a while, and, uh, and it took some uh, some arm twist, diplomatic arm twisting, um, to get it done. But uh, no, we never had. Uh, ultimately, we were able to, to get the people out. Yes, sir. Sorry. The, Have you dealt with any war crimes committed in the Balkans? In the Balkans? Uh, uh, during World War II or presently? Uh, either or. Uh, yes, we had some, we had some instances. Uh, the uh, fellow who uh, was the uh, Minister of the Interior of the puppet state of Croatia during World War II by the name of Andrija Tukovic um, was one of the, our original cases. So we, he was ordered deported back, and he was, we knew who he was early in the 50s when he was here. And we were never able to get him out. And uh, so when our office was set up in the late 70s, he was still floating around. Uh, and so we inherited that case, and uh, we refiled against him, and were eventually able to successfully uh, deport him back to Yugoslavia. And. Uh, as far as the, the modern cases after the, the, the recent wars in, in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, uh, as, as I said, as the Nazi cases were winding down and we started looking at some of the modern uh, war crimes cases, uh, it turned out several of the people who were involved in the uh, uh, Srebrenica massacre in Bosnia, who, where Bosnian Serbs massacred uh, uh, a number of uh, Muslim uh, men and boys outside of Srebrenica in a UN safe zone. Uh, turned out some of those people actually ended up in the United States. And uh, we're living in places you wouldn't imagine living in. We found a large concentration of living in Salt Lake City in Rockford, Illinois. But uh, so yes, yeah, so, so we moved. The things that we applied against our Nazi cases we never really done that before. We were kind of inventing the wheel as, as we went along. So now that we have these modern cases coming along, we know how to, how to prosecute them. We know how to build cases against these individuals. So this, this is just new stuff for us. We didn't do these types of investigations prior to the 1970s. Sure, sure. Sure. Uh, since I was a kid, I've always been interested in history. And I always thought, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to major in uh, when I go to college. So um, when I started college in, uh, in the fall of 1969 at, uh, at Florida Southern College in Lakeland, where uh, Professor Connolly went, to where my wife went, and uh, and if you want to see pictures of what Mike looked like back in college, let me know, and I'll I can share those with you. Uh, you'll be surprised. <laughs> um, so I, going through undergraduate school, I, uh, first two years of undergraduate program, I studied to be a historian or a history teacher or whatever a history major does. I was told a lot of history majors go into law school. I never, that was never in my thinking. And after working for 32 years at the Justice Department, I'm absolutely convinced that was the right choice to make. Um, but uh, in my junior year, I had an opportunity to, uh, to study in Germany. And uh, I had never taken uh, German in my life until I started my freshman year in college. I was taking it as my language requirement. But after a couple of years of it, I was saying, oh, I had a pretty good knack for it. And I didn't realize how little of a knack I had for it until I arrived in Germany and started taking, sitting in courses and listening to professors uh, speak in German all day long. Uh, so, but my German improved uh, uh, commensurately while I was while I was there. But while I was there, I was fascinated by all things uh, German, German culture, German language, linguistics, uh, German history. 
And so when I came back from my last year in, in undergraduate program, I uh, switched my major from history to German. Well, actually, I double majored German and English. And uh, then when I graduated in 73, uh, I went immediately to uh, uh, work on a master's degree in German literature at the University of Arizona in Tucson, still thinking that I was going to go into academia and be a German professor. And then I went on to get my doctorate at the University of Maryland College Park and uh, in Germanic studies, which is culture, literature, linguistics, anything that has to do with, with not just Germany, but the Germanic uh, speaking areas. So Holland and places like that. Uh, still with the idea that I was going to go off and be a professor. While I was just finishing up my classwork for my doctoral program before I wrote my dissertation, I was, uh, had a TA ship and I went down uh, one day to uh, the departmental office to check my mailbox and there was a card on the uh, bulletin board saying that the Immigration and Naturalization Service was setting up a task force to investigate allegations of Nazi perpetrators living in the United States and we were looking for individuals who could do research in the National Archives and other archives for, for the uh, INS. So I went down and I interviewed and, I did, and it was hard and, the, and, the simple, and it was grunt work. I was going down and spending all day cranking through microfilm and blowing dust off of documents in the National Archives, uh, looking for information on these various individuals. Um, then when the Office of Special Investigation was established a year later, they decided to formalize all of this. And so I went from being just a kind of a grunt research analyst at the archives, uh, I was hired as a new historian. That was, a, that was the job description. So here I was, I started out as a history major in college, then I went through this whole thing moving away from history into Germanic studies, and now I was hired to be a historian. And again, the job was only supposed to last maybe four or five years, and I retired after almost, or almost 32 years doing this. So I got to be a historian after all. And it was, it was a mixture of my, my interest in history to start out with, but the, ap the, the opportunity to study abroad, to uh, uh, have an opportunity to observe uh, other cultures up close, uh, to learn to speak that language, uh, learn to think, uh, just because you can translate from English into German, German to English, it doesn't, doesn't always do it because you have to really understand the thinking behind why they say certain things, why they do certain things. And this really came into play when I was carrying out these investigations because uh, when, you, when you interview these people and talk about what they did during the war, uh, I had a, a, a grasp of where they came from and why they th thought certain things. You know, and one of the questions you always ask is, why did you do this? I mean, a lot of these people were, especially the Germans, were highly educated. I mean, the people who were in the killing units, people who were carrying out these uh, the, the programs of extermination were highly educated people. The top people in the German security service uh, were lawyers, were trained as lawyers. You would think they would know the law. Well, their argument was, we didn't break any laws because the laws at that time allowed them to do what they did. Because the Jews were stripped of their rights. So they weren't violating anybody's rights because they didn't have any rights to start out with. We have to understand this, and a lot of the things you can't understand unless you've actually been there and, 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 and really uh, submerged into the culture to understand why they think and do and say the things that they do. And I wouldn't have been able to do any of that had I not taken that year to go to Germany and try out something new. So I highly, if you have an opportunity to do it, I urge you to do so. You won't regret it. And the beer was the beer was good.